Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Heavenly Father, how amazing it is what you've done in our lives, how you have washed away our sin. God, it doesn't matter where we've been. Nothing is too big for you. There's nothing that you can't forgive, that you don't want to forgive, that you don't want to cleanse us from, that you don't want to set us free from. So God, help us not to ever allow shame to keep us from you. Don't ever allow us to allow sin or the, the ugliness of it, God, that we can just come to you and we can fall before you because you're always going to forgive us, God. You will forgive and you will set us free, God, as we're obedient to walk out repentance. God, I pray that you would continue to do miracle works in each one of us because that's what you're doing, a miracle in each person in each heart and we praise you and we thank you for that we thank you God that you are a way maker you make a way when there seems to be no way you keep promises promises that you've given specifically to us or to your body in the word God you are faithful you are just you are good you are holy God and we can trust you. We thank you, God, that we can come to you at any time, any moment, with any need, with all praise, Lord, to your name, lifting you above every circumstance, lifting you, God, above every moment in time in our lives where we feel discouraged or empty, God, you rush in and you shower us with your love and we praise you and we thank you for that Lord this morning Lord I pray that you would be with us that as you've prepared our hearts through worship Lord that you would prepare our hearts for the word that is going to come Lord Jesus God we want to hear from you this morning we love you, Jesus. We give you this time. In your mighty name we pray. Amen? Amen. Awesome. I'm going to take a minute to do a couple of announcements. And kids, if you want to head down, you're welcome to do that. And Chelsea. Is Chelsea up here? Oh, run. Okay, make this quick because you know how much I like being up here. Um, so, one, I wanted to thank you guys for in support of the youth for the coffee shop and everything else. You guys are amazing and it's wonderful. We have some funds to use towards some things that they're looking at putting together this spring and summer. So thank you again. This was just kind of a reminder. I mentioned a while back that for camp, the early registration ends in April. So this would be for parents. If you know kids that are planning to go to camp, it's 190 through April 30th, then it goes up to 210, and then it goes up to 250. So if you know, if you can go out and just do the registration and the $50, that at least gives us an idea kind of who's going so we can kind of start coordinating as far as adults need to go. I'm doing junior teen and senior teen, um, so it kind of helps me know who I'm gonna have so I know who else I need to kind of bring with and so we can get rooms and make sure we're all together so that our kids don't get stuck with other churches. The other thing we have is we are planning a kind of an end of school year, beginning of summer um, trip for the youth. 
We're going to go over by, before you get to Big Sky, kind of down in that um, kind of over by Gallatin area. They're going to camp for two nights, and we're going to zip line, just kind of a big hurrah before the Vandy Sands leave. Hopefully they can still come um, and just kind of get the kids together, kind of build confidence, build each other up, and just have some fun. I am in need of a trailer, for we are in need of a trailer. So if anybody knows of somebody that would be willing to let us use one, I've got my trailer, but I need one more. Um, trailer, possibly truck and trailer, but trailer for sure. The girls are going to be in one trailer. Boys are going to be in the other. Camper trailer, yes, yeah, sorry, camper trailer. So um, it's in June. It's the 10th through the 12th. We'll be back on the 12th. It's right after they get out of school. So um, if you know of anybody or any leads for me, please feel free to catch me or text me or call me. Thank you, guys. All right, we want to send these kids to camp, amen? All right, really quickly, um, on May 2nd, we're going to have a potluck right after service for the Vandy Sants to send them off well and shower them with love. Also on May 6th, uh, Georgie's retirement party. And on May 14th and 15th, we're going to have a work day and paint and build a deck and all kinds of good stuff here at the church. Amen? Amen. So this morning we are honored to have Toby, Melinda, McGill. What? Oh, giving. Sorry. Sorry, I get in a rush. There's three ways to give. <laughs> Through the mail, online, and in the offering boxes. Be obedient. Let's be obedient. Amen? All right, sorry. Toby and Melinda are serving in Mozambique, and we are honored to have them this morning. So come on up. I'm a little more fit than Toby, so he needs the stairs. Hey, if you can see if that video would start, that would be awesome. If not, I'm going to improvise. But Toby and I are so happy to be here. For most of you who know us, I think. Um, those of you who don't, we are here from Helena, Montana. We were gave our lives to Christ. You know, I started teaching with Sandy Badger way back, and I was really rough. Remember that, Sandy? Really rough. And <laughs> and then I came to the Lord with with Toby together. We were baptized together at Helena first, and um, then we went on staff. Um, we have four children, twelve grandchildren. And we were called to Mozambique about 25 years ago. And after the call, it was 22 years later before we went. Um, so if any of you have been called and you're like, God, what happened? Just know God's going to come through because his, his call goes forward and he doesn't take it back. It just might be, what? By the word of our testimonies, how we kept it alive. But anyway, so no video, Alan? Okay, okay, great. Um, so anyway, we are called to Mozambique. Oh, okay, there's probably not going to be sound, but if not, I will talk to you about what's going on in the video. Toby and I build tabernacles, and we drill water wells in Mozambique. And along the road, we do a lot of other things, because it's not where you are, but it's who you are. And when Christ is in you, you just love to share Christ with everybody you know and see. And Toby will share some of that. But this is one of, the, uh, one of our colleagues put this together um, during covid we got to where we couldn't do anything, so we did a lot of team bonding. The churches were shut down tight, and I called up one of our colleagues, and I said, hey, Matt, we have some money. He's a Chi Alpha. Chi Alpha's booming in Mozambique, and I said, we have some money. We have money for a tabernacle that we just hadn't built yet. Why don't you guys, why don't you give me all of your guys that you're training into Chi Alpha, and let's go build a tab. So a tab is a tabernacle church. Um, so this is a video where we were building the tabernacle. And um, it was just awesome. We used the villagers to do it, and we used the interns and staff members. These are Chi, Chi Alpha kids. And then I posted something on Facebook. And when I did that, we had, see, we had five teams cancel coming to Mozambique because of COVID. Well, one of those teams said, hey, Toby, if I send you money for the two tabs that we were going to build, will you do them before you come home? And we were four weeks out from going home at this point. And so we said... We'll do it. So I called Matt back up, and I said, hey, Matt, uh, can we use your team for two more tabs? And so together, the Chi Alpha and us, we built the three tabernacles. And then we got another call from the same pastor. He's out of Legacy, Arkansas. He said, hey, we need to send you money for a well. Would you do a well? 
Now we're one week out from going home, and I'm stressed because it's a six-hour drive there, six-hour drive back, plus setting it up. But, you know, God is faithful. We went, and what we did was we, we repaired a, um, a well that was broken down. Do you, are you able to get any of the pictures up? Okay, thanks. Um, I, w- I wanted to show you a couple pictures of church. So our vision is to see a tabernacle, a church, within walking distance of every Mozambican. Because it was interesting, I was just talking to someone and they said, uh, how do they choose their church? And the Mozambicans choose the church by location, whichever one is closest. And they will go there from the day they arrive to church till the day they die. They will never change churches because it is the closest church. And so we would love to see a tabernacle in walking distance of every Mozambican. Um, The other thing is water wells. Um, A lot of the people are still getting water out of the rivers, and it's very, very dangerous. Um, The church, what? Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm like, what? Um, This is one of the churches that um, I was able to preach at um, out in the village. Um, But this is how they do church. And this is their sanctuary. And this is why we'd like to build churches in Mozambique. Next slide, if you can. Okay, you're good. You're awesome. Awesome. When we build a tabernacle in a village, it brings credibility. So then people want to come. It's like a huge building. And people want to come. They want to know what's going on. So they start coming, and then they hear the word of God. And, you know, it's not only about the building of the tabernacle, but we build amazing friendships while we're there. So it's pretty cool. So anyway, the water, the tabernacles, we want to be within walking distance of every Mozambican. Here's another church service that we had. And Toby has had some cancer, pre-cancer on his head, and he's had some chemo treatments. And he had a hat on, and they asked him to remove it. Very cultural sensitive, culturally sensitive. But this is their, this is their building. This is where they do church. And they don't wear hats in church. And I just thought it was pretty amazing. And it's times like that where we know Toby's been told by a medical doctor, you wear a hat all the time. That's when we know that God's going to protect us because we cannot culturally offend these people um, because that is who they are. Um, This is Esther. I'm so glad you're able to get this picture of Ellen. Esther was um, a, a wonderful lady. I've been with her three or four different times in her village. She was born without the use of her feet. So you can see she crawls. We brought a team brought her these new leather gloves because hers were in pieces. And then she has knee uh, pads on, which I don't think she'll use anymore. I think she wore them just because we brought them, but they weren't going to be work. They weren't going to work for her. But the one thing that's amazing about this lady is that when she was younger, God said, "Go tell people about Jesus." So Esther went from village to village, house to house, and she gave the gospel. She preached the gospel. Today, Esther has started four churches throughout the villages on her knees. I walked nine kilometers to one of her churches. Esther has walked nine kilometers, that's just shy of six miles, to these churches to preach the gospel because there are so many people in Africa that don't hear the gospel. So that is who Toby and I are. We love to do what we do. Um, I'm not sure if they'll get the video. This is where they're collecting water. This is a well we just repaired. It went down. They collect the water from the roof. You can see a piece has fallen to the ground. The water goes into the cistern, and that is how they drink their water. But one thing that um, needs to be really um, understood is even when they have a well, they don't have it pumped into their homes. So they're still going to walk a half a mile with two to three buckets to bring them home. And when we go to villages like that, they give us a shower every morning and every night, which is a bucket, a shower. So they're walking distances so that we can be clean. I'm like, hey, man, I can use wipes for a few days, but you can't because that is what they want to do for us. They want to give us that shower. So um, let's see if this goes. Okay, no sound, but it's still pretty amazing. This is the well, what it was looking like. AG gave them this well, and there's just no water down there, so it's pumping up dirt. And so the week before we left, we were able to find a guided drill and clean. Hey! And here is their clean water. And it's going to keep getting cleaner as we go here. So 
So before this, they were just drinking rainwater. But you know, the most important thing is, is as we bring this physical water for their health, they come to the church, they get discipled by people like Esther, and now they have the living water. So they're not going to thirst any longer. And that's what it's all about, is that living water. So that is who Toby and I are. I will give him the mic and let him talk to you today. Thank you, Melinda. Now, Melinda shared a lot about um, what we do in Mozambique, but it's not about building, it's not about wells, it's about building relationship and bringing the gospel. That's where the eternal fruit comes. And it's because our identity matters, who we are, whatever opportunity arises, God opens up many opportunities for us. But I'm going to share how God brought us to a place to be able to leave, walk away from our careers, be able to leave our family, to go to a place that was unknown. There's always a little fear of the unknown, a little anxiety, to a place that's not near as comfortable as what we have available here, but it's a place where there are people who have not yet heard the gospel. And there are people who, who get, that's a place where God has called us. And we have learned that when God has your heart there, you can overcome anything. Amen? Amen. So has anybody ever felt like, they weren't able to do anything worthy for God because of what they've done or who they thought they were. Is anybody besides me? See, has anyone ever ever felt like you couldn't do anything or you're, you have a low self-esteem because of what somebody may have said to you or an experience that you've had in life? And you're just like, just getting by. See, I've experienced these things and I was really struggling and I'm going to share where God brought me the place that he brought me to be able to understand my true identity in him. See, that's really a powerful experience for me, but he guided me to this place to where I could understand that identity because my identity was misplaced. It was misplaced on my past. It was misplaced on who I thought I was. Even though I knew up here, I'm a child of God now, I'm serving Jesus, it didn't really sink here until... God brought me to this place. So I'm going to talk about that, but I want to look at uh, Gideon's life, just a glimpse of Gideon's life, and I'm going to start reading in Judges in chapter 6. But one thing I want to um, bring out, this is, this is a powerful um, place of texture, or of the, of the uh, I just lost the word, no. But anyway, this, the scripture here is very powerful. And what I'm going to do is extract some of, the, um, some of the conversation that God had with Gideon, the angel of the Lord had with Gideon. And, but it's a, I'm not going to go through every single verse because it's very long. But I encourage you to read the whole story because there's a lot of really good nuggets in there. And there's a lot of powerful things through this whole scripture. But I want to share how Gideon saw himself at first, and then how he was able to overcome things in the end. And so I do encourage you, please find some time after today or even this afternoon possibly to, to be able to do that. Now I'm going to read, starting in, in chapter 6, starting at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat underneath. Actually, I'm going to give you a little bit of history before I start reading. The people of Israel did, not, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so he gave the Israelites into the hand of Midian for seven years. See, whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and Amalekites and the people from the east would come against them. They would encamp around and devour the produce that the Israelites were planting and, and preparing for food for themselves. They would come with their livestock and their tents, and they... They would come like locust in number. It's a number that can't be counted. They came in, and so this, these are the people that the angel of the Lord is talking to Gideon about. But they brought Israel very low in, in who they were for a period of time. So the Lord was speaking to Gideon. Now the angel of the Lord came, starting verse, verse 11, chapter 6 came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress 
to hide it over, hide it from the Midianites, so that they wouldn't take that as well. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. See, the Lord spoke into Gideon his true identity in him. See, as a child of God and in his purpose that God created him in this for this moment. Verse 13, and Gideon said to him, please, Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all these things happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But how did the Lord, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon's identity of himself is misplaced. It's misplaced on his circumstances that surround them. He's looking at, well, God can't be with us because of our circumstances. Look, it doesn't seem to be evident. And we sang that song this morning, which is very appropriate. God is still working, and he's still doing things, even though we don't see that. But see, his circumstances here in the scripture, in, this, in his perspective of God just not being with him, he was didn't think he could do anything for the Lord. Verse 14, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I, not, how can I save Israel? Behold, I'm, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Look at my family. Now look at, and I'm the smallest of my family. How can you use me? I can't see that I can do anything for you. And so the Lord said in verse 14, and the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? See, that was, that was what he said, but Gideon still didn't get it. His identity is attached and misplaced. And the Lord said to him after that, after he's looking at himself in the least of these, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So you see, Gideon's misplaced identity and his own perspective did not change his true identity in Christ. It did not change his identity through the eyes, nor his potential that God had in his life, even though his perspective was wrong. If Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior, we are his children, and we know that. But sometimes we can misplace our identity in who we think we are, or through our circumstances in what we see in our circumstances. So it's about getting our identity from our heads into our heart as a default, because our identity matters. It really does. If we truly in our hearts believe that, we know that God is always with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Amen? Amen. So listen to this good news. Just because Gideon's perspective did not agree with God's perspective, it did not change God's perspective of Gideon. And just because our perspective of who we are may not agree with God's perspective of who we are, it does not change our true identity in Christ, nor our potential in him. See, our identity matters. It really matters as followers of Christ. See, something happened in, in verse 22. Let's take a look. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. God assured to him that he wasn't going to die for seeing him face to face. But Gideon had revelation that the angel of the Lord was with him in spite of his circumstances when he spent time with him. He spent time with the angel of the Lord. He talked to him. He listened. He had conversation with him. He was close to him. He did some things in the scripture that you'll read later if you read through this passage. But he did some things to reassure that truly you are God. And it gave him this revelation. Now after this revelation, he was able to do some powerful things. And I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. But let's go to verse 33. Now all the Midianites and Malachites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. There were 22,000 people that came out to follow him to go against the Midianites 
in number like locusts that you can't even count. 22,000. So God told Gideon, the people are too many. Too many for me to give you and give the Midianites into your hand. Lest Israel boast that they did it themselves because they had 22,000. He said, that's too many. So I want to eliminate almost all of them. This is my short version now. You have to go back and read because the details are powerful. And if we had the time, I'd like to go over every, every verse with it and, and expand on it. But God wanted the glory. And sometimes he asks us to do what we don't think we can do because he wants the glory. You see, when I became ang anxious, God had me walk away from my business. I didn't have anxiety to do that because God was so close to me and I knew whatever he's asked me to do, he was with me. So he said it wasn't time to go into missions yet and he asked me just to serve him while I wait. So that's when I went on staff at Helena First for six years. And then he said, okay, now it's time to go. Well, that was years after he had me walk away from my business and I'm thinking, okay, my memory isn't as, as great as it used to be 10 years ago, five years ago. And I started feeling anxiety, and I thought, I found myself asking God, God, are you sure I'm going to be able to do what you're asking me to do? And after two weeks of asking him this question, he said, why are you trying to find your confidence in yourself? Of course, we must have our confidence in him who is with us, because he is with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We need to be encouraged with that, with whatever God asks us to do, but still, Gideon dealt with fear when God was asking him to do some things, some pretty crazy things that he knew he was going to have repercussions. And he was able to overcome his fear because he knew God was with him. I want to move down to chapter 7, verse 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let the others go every man to his home. So the people took provision in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest to Israel, every man to his tent, but retained 300 men. Now Gideon is still a little bit fearful in this because he has 300 people with him. And look at the people that you can't even count. And so God is going to use him. And God said, if you're still afraid, I want you to go down to their camp. Sneak down to their camp, and I will confirm to you that I have given them into your hand. So he snuck down into the camp, near the camp, and he overheard one of the Midianites talk of a dream he had. And it was a dream that, that a roll of, of straw rolled down and hit the camp and just wiped out the camp. And the other one said, surely God has given us into the hand. God is with them, given them into the hand of Midian and the Israelites. And so... They started, God started spreading fear through them. So this gave Gideon the courage to overcome his fear that whether he was going to make it or not. But even though he was afraid, he overcame his fear because he knew God was with him. Because our identity matters. And when we have our identity of child of God, our Father's with us. See, Gideon had the, the time to over, or the chance to overcome, but let's go to verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. When the 300 company, 300, excuse me, the three companies of 100 blew the trumpets and broke the jars, they held in their left hands the torches and in their right hand trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and the army ran. They cried out and fled. How many would go to war with a torch and a trumpet? I mean, just I picture myself in Gideon's place, and, and how can we have the courage to do something like that in front of a sea of people that you can't even count? How can you have this courage? Only knowing that God is with you and understanding who God really is in our lives and understanding our identity as a child of God. 
You see, that's the only way we can do that. Gideon saved Israel from the hand of Midian with 300 men. And please go back and read the whole story because there's so much here that, that I'm sad that I can't go over it all, but we don't have a couple hours. <laughs> but see, do you think this would have happened if Gideon couldn't overcome his fear? Do you think this would have happened if Gideon didn't have his misplaced identity replaced by who God was saying he tru who he truly is? See, this is so important. Our identity is so important. It really matters. So how did Gideon come from a place of seeing himself through the circumstances and misplacing his identity, where he came from, and who he was in his family, to seeing his potential in who God says he is as a child of God and God was with him? See, I want to take a look at, a, at another scripture in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. See, God laid it out for us where we can come to a place as Gideon came. He spent time with, with the angel of the Lord. He continued to converse until he had that revelation, until the Lord gave him that revelation. And so this is about the great commandment, starting in verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, he's telling us the greatest commandment. And there's a reason why this is the greatest commandment. Because out of that comes our ministry. Out of that comes our love for ourselves, the way Jesus sees us. And out of that comes our love for others. You see, I was, I was talking to somebody who was really struggling. She says, I have trouble with the second part of that. Love your neighbors as yourself. And as we began to talk, I began to realize that she was hurting inside from her past. And what the Lord had really put on my heart, if she spends time with the Lord God Almighty, if she takes that time to allow him to say, this is who you really are. You are my daughter. I have anointed you. I have a purpose for you. I love you so much, you are so special. Then she would be able to understand how to love people as she loves herself. See, God brought me to a place just like this. And there are some of you here today that, that may have heard, may remember this, because I know some of you have heard it before. But I'm going to share how God brought me to this place because I didn't think I could do anything worthy for God. I was too afraid to talk to somebody about Jesus. God, the next time I get a chance, I'm going to tell them about you. I failed again because I chickened out. So God, just, just to touch on how he brought me to this place, he gave me a conviction. And I learned from my past that if I ignored it long enough, it just fades away, right? Amen? Anybody experience that <laughs> besides me? So I also learned that conviction is a great thing because it gives us the strength to do what God asks us to do or not to do. You embrace his conviction. And he gave me a conviction to take my idle time, which was on the, watching TV and on the computer for two and a half hours. He said, those things aren't bad, but I want you, instead of doing that, I want you to spend your time with me. And at the time, if I prayed every day, five minutes was a long prayer. What am I going to do for two and a half hours? I don't know, but he wants me to do it, so I'm going to do it. During the two hours, he had me clean out my house. Powerful, weight lifted from my shoulders. But in this time, he gave me a vision. And this vision is very powerful, as some of you may, have, may remember. But it was just of me and Jesus, and Jesus was one and a half times taller than I was, and there's just glory all around him. And he's standing over here, about a four-foot radius of glory all around him. And I'm standing over there, and I'm looking at Jesus in his glory, and I'm in awe. Oh, wow, this is, this is Jesus in his glory standing before me. And he said, Toby, come to me. And so I began to walk over, and I stopped at the edge of his glory, and I'm close enough to see his face and his eyes. And he said, come closer. So I took that last step into his glory. My heart and my spirit was overwhelmed because he 
gave me revelation of who I was in him. He began to pour out his love on me and said, Toby, you are special as we all are to him. We need to put ourselves in a place to hear that from Jesus. Yeah. See, he's just loving on me and perfecting his love in me and healing me of who I thought I was, healing me of my past, healing me of what my circumstances were, of my misplaced identity. And he began to give me my identity in him. And he said, now, Toby, I want you to do this. So I turned from his glory and a sword appeared in my hand and I swung the sword. He stood behind me at the same time with his sword and said, it is done. And I couldn't wait to get back into his glory. And he's loving on me and perfecting his love in me and showing me how special I was and, and how, why he created me and how much he loved me. And, and just I was just overwhelmed. No words could describe. No words even came to mind because I, I was overwhelmed in my heart and my spirit. And he said, now, Toby, do this. And so I turned again, a sword appeared in my hand, and I swung the sword, which just represents what he asked me to do. And he stood behind me at the same time and said, it is done. And I couldn't wait to get back into his glory. He said, Toby, this is how I want you to live life as you follow me. Live life, not just close enough to see my face, not just close enough to see what I'm doing around you, but close enough to be in my glory. Because this is where you'll find your identity in me. This is where you'll find the courage to overcome the thing, the courage to do what I ask you to do. And this is where you'll find the strength to overcome the things you need to overcome as you serve me. It's out of this place of knowing God is with you in a powerful way. Not just knowing here, but knowing here in your spirit. Spending that time of being that close to God, pressing in. See, out of that place, we can learn to love ourselves as God loves us. I've experienced that. I know that through that experience. And the Bible tells us right here, the great and first commandment, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I lived a life knowing him and calling on him when I was in big trouble, but not living a life for him. And I didn't love him until I got to know him, until I got close to him. We are to love him, so we need to be close to him so that we can hear him clearly as well. But that's what God desires is the biggest blessing in our lives, and we can receive that in his presence. See, God doesn't want to do what we can do, but he so desires to do what he can do. Because when God has us on his heart, I believe he has other people on his mind. And how can we overcome our fear to go across the street and talk to somebody, or even our neighbor? I had, it just froze me up to think about talking to my neighbor about Jesus years ago. But now that he has perfected his love in me and I understand who I am, that's who I am. I talk to people about the Lord because I have received something that nobody else can, that nobody can without being close to Jesus. You see, he had us walk away from our careers. Melinda taught for 16 years and teaching was her passion. And I owned a business for 15 years, ex or 25 years, and worked partnered with my dad here in town. And God gave us so much favor, he had to cut chop down my tree. Like Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the tree that stood above the forest. He chopped it down but left the stump and the roots. He chopped down my tree because I was saying, look what we have done in our business. But God began to lift his hand and said, now who are you? Who? Like anybody else out there. And he'd put his hand back on, and he did this for two years until I understood I am nobody except for a child of God under his hand. It's not what I do, but it's what he does through me. So he's given me the gifts that I have. And this is how we can misplace our identity as well. There are many ways. I want to talk about identity. People might identify us by our behavior, by the things we say, by the things we do, by the words we use. But from, from who do we think we are or what we've done in our past, our source of identity are th one of three things. One is what other people think about us or what other people say about us that give us a false identity. 
See, and it could be a bully from when we were ch a child, and we tuck that memory away. We don't even remember it anymore, but that helps shape our character or who we think we are. It could be experiences in our lives that were out of our control, that I'm, I'm shamed and I'm not, I can't do things for the Lord because of, of this that happened. See, other people can work on giving us a false identity that we take on as, well, this happened to me, so that's who I am. But see, there, even being a people pleaser, you know, serving people is great, but when you serve people to please God, that's, that's where God wants us to be, not to please people. See, there are many, many different things and circumstances that can give us our identity, but, but see, we get our identity sometimes from who we think we are. God gifted me with my hands. He, he blessed our business, our company, that he asked me to walk away from. It was hard, but until... I probably wouldn't have been able to do it until he realized or make me realize that it was because of him that our business did so well. When I realized that, I don't want to be there out from under his hand. I want to follow him under his hand. You see, I thought because of my giftings, I had my identity attached to what I can do because he gifted me very, very much with my hands. And, and I used that gift to bring glory to him in Africa building tabernacles but if I had an accident to cut off my hands there was a point in my life that I would have thought I am nobody I can't do anything anymore and I would have gone into depression because that's where my identity was but you see if our if our true identity is in our hearts it doesn't matter what our, what happens in our circumstances I'm still a child of God today God is still with me I can do whatever God asked me to do because I know God is with me in that way. You see, sometimes we place our identity in our success, or our children's success, or maybe even how much we do for others. Yeah, I'm that guy, you know. And, and it was really painful when God showed me how deep my pride went as being a man of integrity, as being a man of God, always being in church and always serving and always doing this. That was part of my identity as well. What, what happens if those circumstances change? What happens if COVID happens and I'm stuck in the house? Then who am I? I'm not that guy that's always serving at church, but I am still a child of God. God has us cross paths with people. It doesn't have to be in church. It's got to be outside the church. When, God, when people see the church, they need to see people, not a building. But see... If we misplace our identity because our identity matters, it can hurt us and it can hurt the kingdom. See, the third uh, source of our identity, one of the main sources and should be the main source, is from our Heavenly Father and who He says we are. See, we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We were created in His image. We are loved by God. We are His workmanship. We are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and we are the sons of God. We are women and men, children of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. See, we live and minister of the sense of who we are, who we believe we are. And we must know here as a default that we are children of God. And so out of that, out of loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind comes eternal fruit because we do it in Christ. We do things in the Lord. And so how do we get that? How do we get that from our heads down into our hearts, into our spirit? And we do that by spending time with the Lord. Like I mentioned before, God had me spend two and a half hours with him every day. At the end of those seven days, I entered into the manifest presence of God, and I had to ask my pastor, what am I experiencing? I know it's from God, but what is this? What do you call it? And for eight and a half months, I began to learn a lot of spiritual truths, but that was because I stepped in to his glory. I wanted to know him. I wanted to hear from him. I wanted to be the person that if somebody's sitting on the side of the road and they're hurting, and they say, God, if you're really out there, then send somebody to me to say, Jesus is real. I want to be that guy that God sends over there across the street. I want to be the guy that lays hands on somebody and God heals them. You see, our identity matters. 
It's not just who we are, but we find our joy in being a child of God. We find our joy in being with the Lord. See, when we can be in this place, I want to share, even though we oversee the building of tabernacles and well drilling, and I tell all the teams that come over to build the churches, I said, you know, I'm not going to be building the whole time because I always spend time with the pastors praying with them. I spend time with, with the neighbors that come in to see what's going on, and I talk to them about the Lord. And I spend time with the people because it's about the relationship. If teams come over and build a building and, and blow in, blow up, and blow back out, the people will be standing there looking at that empty building and say, what happened? What's this about? I want them to know what this is about. Jesus loves them. I want them to know, and I want them to see a life change and experience the presence of God and the Holy Spirit that is with us because we are children of God, right? Amen? The Holy Spirit is with us. We take the Holy Spirit, the light, into the darkness. You see, that's part of our purpose that we don't even have to think about if it's here because it's who we are. See, even, even that, we get home in the evening, God started putting on my heart, okay, we want, I want you to start a Bible study outside the gate. Now our house has a big wall around it, electric fence around it, bars on the doors and windows so that we can sleep peacefully at night, and we have guards through the night. But all the guards sit out on the street watching the entrance into all the houses. God wants me to start a Bible study with the guard community outside. The guard community is the low community, and that's in the eyes of the Mozambicans. But God began to give us favor. My first guard, when we moved in, I was building some small pieces of furniture for our home, and this guard was really paying attention. Our guard was, and, and so I began, God just put on my heart, why don't you teach him how to build wood, wood furniture? And so I asked him, I said, would you like to build something? He goes, yeah, I would. I didn't realize when God was putting this, he was making a plan to build um, the relationship we're all about relationship because we're children of God, right? God's about relationship. So I began to teach him how to build this. He chose to build this beautiful chest, and, and it turned out very nicely. Gave it, gave it to him. He brought it home and, and delivered it for him because he walks an hour and a half to work and walks an hour and a half back. But he ended up, when we were up in the cyclone area, there were two cyclones that hit up north. And so Melinda and I brought a lot of relief, food, clean water, clothes, tents. And so we brought all that up, and you'll see some pictures on the computer out back after, after service if you'd like to look at some of those. But as we were doing that, our guard got sick and I asked him to eat so he would be strong so that I would see him when we got back. And he didn't answer me at first, and I said, will you do that for me? And he said, okay, I'll do that. So the day we came home, it was nine weeks living out of the back of our vehicle, sometimes in dorms and sometimes in a hotel. But we were up there serving through the church and bringing relief to people and sharing the gospel as we went. We came home after nine weeks, and he greeted us at home and helped unload our cars. I wouldn't help him, let him help unload the heavy things because I could tell he had lost a lot of weight. The next day, I got a phone call. He passed away. Life is fragile. They don't have medical help. They get sick, and a lot of them pass away for that reason. You see, he was, he was a man who honored us. And God had me leave something for him and his family through him building this. I thought he would use the trade and start making funds doing that. That was my idea, but God knew. God knew he was going to take him. So we met his son, his oldest son, and God put on our hearts to hire his oldest son because his family didn't have an income anymore. We lost a father, lost an income, and I found out that they lost their mother four years ago. His oldest son has three younger siblings. So we brought him in and taught him how his dad um, honored us in being a guard, so he's one of our guards. So God is telling me, start this Bible study outside the gate. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm a detailed person. I need to make sure everything is in order, and I need to have, uh, just in case I don't know some of the Portuguese words that they're going to use or the questions, I want to make sure that I can articulate the gospel well. So I want an interpreter with me, and I'm trying to coordinate that. And it's just not coming together, and God convicts me. He said, just do it. I will be with you. We heard that this morning? Okay, I committed at that moment in that conviction, 
Next week I'm starting on this day. That same day, my second guard came up to me and said, Toby, my eyes are burning so bad, they're all bloodshot and red, and I can't read the Bible you gave me last week, and, and I can't even see, it's really obstructing my eyes. And I said, so how long has this been happening? He said, it's been happening three or four years. Actually, he said four or five years, off and on, but he said more on than off. He said, I've been in the hospital, I've talked to the doctors, they gave me all kinds of different medications, nothing works. He said, it just hurts. I said, well, let's ask Jesus to bring healing to you. And so we prayed together, and I went in the house to gather some things because I had a meeting in a half hour. And a half hour later, I go out the front door, and my gate opens, and he comes running in. Toby, Toby, guess what? God healed my eyes. He said, look at them. There's no pain. And they were whiter than anybody's eyes I've seen. Well, praise God. He said, I was just outside the gate telling all the other guards what God did for me. Amen? Amen? God is gathering a group that he wants to me start my Bible study. I don't have to worry about it. He's doing it. We just get to be a part of it. How exciting is that when we say yes to God? Amen? So the first day of the Bible study, I'm thinking, okay, this is, there was a big downpour, and there was, I was discipling a university student who was in the Chi Alpha program with one of our other colleagues, and he happens to speak English. He just called me up earlier that day. Hey, can I come over? And so we're talking about the Bible and about some things there. And I said, hey, you want to stay a little bit later tonight? I got a Bible study going. So God provided me with a, an interpreter. I didn't even have to line it up. So we went out and I began to talk to my guard, the son of my first guard. And his first question was, where do you go when you die? That's a great question. I'd like to talk to you about that. So we talked about it. And he received Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And he is on fire for Jesus today. Every time I see him, okay, what was the last thing you read in the Bible? Well, I read this. And it seemed kind of strange. Well, let's sit down and talk about it. So we would just, I just began to disciple him on the side of the Bible studies. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go back for itineration, Lord. I'm not sure what's going to happen to the Bible study, but I know you had me started. I'm just going to let you worry about that. And so during the last two weeks as we're packing up our house and trying to get everything set for us to leave the country, I'm hearing another lady outside the gate, and she is passionately preaching about Jesus. And I'm listening to what she's saying. It's like, yeah, she's on. She's right on out there. And so I heard her the next week. And so I asked my guard, I said, who is this lady that I'm hearing out there? He goes, oh, it's a lady from the, an Assembly of God church over here in this neighborhood. God brought somebody else in to continue the Bible study because she's coming by and she walks by there every day. And so he knows what he's doing. And he gets the glory because I didn't do it. I was just obedient to what he asked me to do. Amen. God is, is almighty and all-powerful. And he is our father because we are his children and our identity matters. You see, in our identity, we can overcome anything we got puts our heart somewhere in our identity when we have that time with the Lord and I want to ask us to just start maybe God's going to start stirring in your hearts as we finish up here what is it that you're doing in your schedule that to him is just idle time it's our unwind time it's whatever it could be something little something big like it was for me he had to evidently get my attention in a big way but he may be asking us to change something when we go home in our routine and spend that time just one-on-one, -on -one, un just not doing something else with that, but just one-on-one -on -one with him so that we can hear his perspective of us and who we are. We can hear how much he truly loves us and we can receive our identity through his eyes so that we can also love others as he loves them. You see, when we're in that place, we, we just need to give and make the most of ourselves available to God for the sake of those who are far from God. See, I'm, I met somebody in high school every day. I walked four blocks, and then two girls would walk this way, and I'd walk this way, the other way. I didn't know that one of them was a pastor's daughter, and the second one was um, her dad was a leader in the church. But we had four blocks of conversation every day after high school. And she wouldn't hang out with my group, and I wouldn't hang out with her group, because I thought they were boring. What did I find out later? It's something different. 
But see, when I started going, when we were invited to an Assembly God church, First Assembly, it's a church I grew five blocks behind. I didn't know what happened inside those walls. But we were invited in there, and I saw her there, and she talked to me. She said, I've been praying for you. She's been on her knees for me for years. I said, God, if you can get a hold of his heart, he would do great things for you. And I'm not doing it for God. I'm doing it because of God. I'm doing it because of his love for me, and because he asked me to. That's what it looks like. But see, when we get ourselves in this place, we can overcome the fears that we have of talking to our neighbor or talking to somebody across the street. We can overcome the fear because we know God is with us and that's who we are and that's what he wants us to do. We can overcome those things. We can all pray. We can all take some time out of the day and pray. And we can't make it a burden. See, serving God, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We don't want to put extra burdens on ourselves. We just want to do what God wants us to at the end of the day. Amen? We don't have to sacrifice, although sometimes obedience takes sacrifice, but it's out of love, so it doesn't seem like a sacrifice because we experience his love in all that we do for him. But we can all pray. Maybe God's stirring your heart to go full-time into missions, and you didn't think you can because of your past or because of what you've done or who you think you are. Maybe he's stirring that call in you, or maybe like Melinda mentioned earlier, Maybe you were called as a child, and you thought, well, it just never happened, so I'm going to just let it go. It must have been just, just a moment with the Lord. But it was 22 years between the time we were called, as she mentioned, until the time he said to go. And we kept our call alive by speaking the word of our testimony. We're going to be missionaries. He called us to be missionaries. We will be missionaries one day, and everybody that knew us knew that. Even Melinda's principal knew that. And so that's how we walked out, because that was a part of our identity. Because this is who we are. We're a child of God. He's called us to do that. We don't know when. We're ready to go as soon as he says go. Melinda will tell you we're slow, but I'm telling you it's God's timing, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> you see, when we have the courage to step out and go when God wants us to go, you have the courage to spend a little bit extra time in prayer when God wants us to, we know God is with us. Maybe he's renewing a call that you had as a child today. Maybe he's calling you to give beyond your means to help reach people far from God across your fence or outside the borders of America. You know, I want to encourage you, if God is challenging you, he has always challenged me with my finances. And that's how I, part of how I was watching God with me along the way, in a, in a powerful way. And if, if, you're, if you want to talk about God's challenge and giving, you can talk to me, and I'd love to share some stories with you out back. But point being, when we know who we are, because our identity matters, and we know God is with us, and he asks us to do something, this is an opportunity to see miracles of God happen through our lives because we do things in him and we see lives changed we see people that have never heard the word of Jesus and they receive Christ and you can see the glistening in their eye after they do that and the joy that comes on them how exciting is that the greatest miracle salvation a gift that is free for us but it's a gift that costs the father his son it's a gift that Jesus chose to lay down his life and he had joy because he saw what that was going to bring but it's a place where, as our identity says, we are children of God. It's not just who our identity says. The Bible says that. But we need to know what the Bible says, and we need to believe it. We need to hear it by the Holy Spirit, and we need to believe it. Because he is the one that gives us this identity. So I just want to take a moment and pray and just lift this up to the Lord. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I thank you for the love that you have for us. I thank you that you care enough to not let us stay where we are or not let us be stuck in our misplaced identity. But Lord, I just ask, Father, that you would move in our hearts this morning. And just, God, as we just submit this, your word, back to you, 
I plead your blood over it. I pray, Father, that you would continue to stir it in each heart that heard your word this morning. Lord, as we walk out the doors, let us stir. As we sit at home, let us stir. As we go to work, let us stir. Lord, our true identity in you. Lord, give us that courage to step into your glory, not just close enough to see what you're doing. But give us that courage to make that last step. Lord, I just ask, Father, that as you begin to, to reveal to people, to each one of us in here, me included, Lord, what else can I change? What time can I give you that you ask for? Or that we can be obedient. And I just pray, Father, that your hand would be upon each one of us, that you would bless us as your children, that you would bless our home as you have blessed us with a home. God, I pray, Father, that, that you would help us to be different, help us to shift our schedules a little bit so that we don't get back into our normal routine or that we stay in our normal routine. But, Lord God, we would begin to branch out, that we would begin to look for opportunities. We would begin to see divine moments with you. Lord, we would be, see the evidence of you with us because you are. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, Lord, I thank you, Father, for a fresh anointing upon each one of us today. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us through conviction, that gives us the courage to do what you ask us to do, your presence and your Holy Spirit that continues to remind us of our identity in you through conviction, and then the strength to overcome those things that we need to overcome as we serve you. Lord, this is all for your glory and your name and your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. made it. It's been a while, right? Yay. So we just heard the missionary speak, right? We always love that. But I want to know, how did that make you feel? Like, what did that do inside of you guys? Should have done a whole lot. Um, we got a lot of people gone today. And you guys that are gone today, you're either listening online right now, or hopefully you will be listening online in the future, and this is very much for you guys as well. When we, when we hear the stories from the mission field, we're seeing God at work in a way where us in the U.S., we're just too busy for a lot of those things. But when we hear these stories, it should do something within us. And it should cause us to ask, what can I do there? But what can I do here? What can I do to help them minister more? But God, what do you want to do within myself to help me minister more right here? So we have an opportunity right now to, to, to really take both of those, those ends of, of the spectrum and pull them in close together because I believe that God wants to do stuff in us today in order to reach our community better, to reach our families better, to reach our friends better. I believe that God is asking us to do that. And he speaks through missionaries as they're talking about faraway places. He's talking about us right here. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we, we listen to this and we say, oh my gosh, God is moving there. There's people there that, that, that don't have a 1% a, a of what we do. They don't have the opportunities that we have. So how can we partner with, with missionaries in order to help Places like that. Places that we may never visit. People that we may never meet. But we can meet those people. And we can minister to those people through these people. So in that respect, God is saying, I want to accomplish something in you today, right now, for you, for this community, for your family. And I want to accomplish something for the people in Mozambique through this missionary couple in partnership with you. So there's different ways that we can do that. 
The first way is to open our hearts to God and say, God, what do you have for me? I want everything that you have for me. Give me the boldness. Give me the wisdom. Give me the courage to step out into that and to start affect the people that are around me. And then we also say, but how can I also help people halfway around the world? How can we do that? Well, that's easy. That's with our finances, right? Because what we're doing with our finances is we are going to equip them to do things. And as missionaries, they go to the mission field and then they have to come back on furlough and itinerate because God's saying, but, but I want you to do more. And I want you to get into these churches and I want you to speak my message to affect these people where they're at right here. But I want to give those people opportunity to be a part of what I'm doing over here. So we give to them because their work budget expands, correct? And, and they just, their budget goes up. So you guys need several things. You guys need your, your work budget. You need your personal budget. You need your cash money that just goes into the account, correct? We can be a part of that. And in a minute, we're going to pass the, the buckets around. I call them buckets, they're baskets. But I want to give to this couple. And I want you guys to, to give generously. If you're listening online, I want you to go to the website. I want you to go to the, the giving page. And I want you to pull that down. And I want to put your credit card number in there and designate those funds. And just like Toby was talking with, with Gideon, it's one of those things where we can say, oh, yeah, I could financially give this. I could do this. And I could take credit for doing that. Or we can choose to step out in faith and give something that we don't necessarily have, but then we watch God meet that. It's amazing with missions. We don't have $100 to give, but we give $100, and all of a sudden God puts $100 into our account. Yeah, I can't explain it, but that's God's way. I'm listening and talking, and all I can think about is, man, we need to build a well. How much does it cost to build a well? About 10000 If we said, you know, there's no way we can just raise $10,000, right? But if we can say we can rely on God to begin to bring that money in, and every week, every Sunday, we begin to, to, to put a little bit more to that, and God gives you money out of nowhere, and we say, man, I want to build a well. And we begin to, to bring that in. I think we could do that. What do you guys think? Do we put that limit on God? Do we put the... Put the Put the jar over the flame? Or do we break the jar and say, God, do what you want to do in us right now, in our community and halfway around the world? So I'm asking you guys to, to give. I, I, want, I want to bless these guys hugely. I want to send them out. I, I, I not only want to do that, I want everybody in here today on their way out, I want you to grab a prayer card. I want you to, to encourage them. I want you to ask questions. You just do whatever God is asking you to do. But let's be faithful to pray for this couple. Let's get them back on the field as soon as possible because as much as it's good to be here and to be going and ministering in churches, God didn't call you to just that. God called you to those people. Those people are waiting. Those people are ready. Those people are longing to have you back. So let's get them back as quickly as possible. Amen. So worship team, if you guys want to come back up, we're going to pass around the baskets. I want you to fill it up. Like I said, if it's like, man, I don't carry checks on me. I don't have cash on me. Get on your phone. Bridge Assembly, bridgehelena.com. Go to the giving page. Designate it. To, to missions on this day to the McGills and, and it'll all get to them but let's bless this couple let's bless them with encouragement on your way out you guys you know what you guys go, go to your table I know how it is sometimes you get stuck in the sanctuary it's better to get stuck at your table um, but man we're with you guys we want to stand with you guys we want to bless you guys we want to support you guys alright I'm going to pray and then we'll pass those, those baskets around. Fill them full. Let them be overflowing. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for, for your word today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for bringing that word to us and helping us understand that, Lord God, our identity is, is in you. It's not our identity that we make for ourselves, but our identity is in you. So establish that identity in each one of us. Lord God, give us the urging to, to do more for you whether it be in this community with our families as well as halfway around the world, which I believe is what you do want to do. Lord God, equip us to do just that. Holy Spirit, 
as we heard those words, let them change us. Help us to not leave today the same way that we came in. We bless your holy name. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. And everyone shouted, Amen. Amen. You guys love on each other. Talk to the missionaries. Just have a good time. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.